Hi, I'm Lynn Cornell, and welcome to Journey Through the Bible Verse by Verse. Grab your Bibles and follow along as we study through each book of the Bible, verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Keep in mind that I am using the Holman Christian Standard Bible, so if you're reading from a different Bible translation, the read would be different, but the message would be the same. We're going to continue in our study through the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Now, this chapter, actually chapters 5, 6, and 7, are popularly known as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but they are foundational in many ways. Not only to the large crowds. Uh, let me read the first verse and kind of give a background here of what's going on. Verse 1 says, When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountain. And after he sat, his disciples came to him. Now, if, if you remember in chapter 4, Jesus was introduced by John the Baptist as the Messiah. In fact, in John's gospel, John said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's then led into the wilderness um, and is tempted for 40 days. Then he comes out of the uh the wilderness, and he begins his itinerant preaching ministry. Now, he's healing people, though so, um, the sick are being healed, the demon possessed are being set free, and the gospel is being preached. He's also assembled his core group, his 12 disciples, whom later he will name as apostles. And so this is kind of where we're at right here, that He's on the mountain. And this Sermon on the Mount is really Jesus' criteria for being his disciples. This is what his requirements, this is what his expectations are for being his disciples. Now, this is, as I said, so, so this is foundational in many ways because we're going to see, and I'm going to just share it in a moment, how that... Um, the apostles will build their theology off of this sermon and off of the teachings as well as the teachings of Jesus. This sort of condensed right here in this Sermon on the Mount. So this, this chapter is, I mean, this sermon, you can say, is, it's foundational. Now, um, oh, verse 2, that's another thought I wanted to, to say here, but... Uh, it says, then he began to teach them. Oh, this is what I wanted to say before I get into this too, before I get back to the, to the reading. Um, th this teaching also is, as, as well as Matthew's message, is going to be in stark contrast, okay, to the righteousness or what, what the Jews had come to know as righteousness, as obedience to the law as taught by the Pharisees, which were corrupt. And so really, really, this is to teach them or unteach them <laughs> the, the extremely corrupt and bad teaching or theology that came from the Pharisees. Okay, so, so this is what you're going to see right here. Now verse 2, then he began to teach them saying, the poor in spirit are blessed, for theirs is the kingdom, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Those who mourn are blessed, for they will be comforted. The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed, for they will be filled. The merciful are blessed, for they will be shown mercy. The pure in heart are blessed, for they will see God. The peacemakers are blessed, for they will be called sons of God. Those who are persecuted for righteousness, for righteousness are blessed, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult and persecute you and falsely say all, every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay. Now, <laughs> um, these are commonly known as the Beatitudes. 
Okay, I kind of take issue with that. I don't fully agree with that because um, these qualities, these are qualities, these are more than just a kind of an attitude towards life. This is what we should be. Which is kind of interesting because we see this as a pattern that the very first thing that Jesus is doing in order to qualify his disciples is to first deal with their character. In other words, again, th this is who we should be. This, 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 is, this should be our nature, our character, our actions, our thoughts. In other words, really, in some respect, this is what we call the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, when God plants the Word of God in our souls, in our spirit, then the fruit of that should the, the the fruit that is born from that planting of the word is this character. Now you should also note, remember, this is what his criteria is for being a disciple. So um, he th this is what we should be. This is the very first thing, which is going to be interesting when we get to the seventh chapter. That the idea of um, it's going to take. <laughs> Um, most of your time, our time, and really perfecting ourselves, okay? Now, the very first thing he says is, blessed. You might kind of note that I'm so used to reading the King James Bible. I like this translation of the Bible, but I'm so used to reading the King James, so sometimes this, I stumble over when I say, blessed are they, and this, this translation had reworded it. But the idea of the word bless. And by the way, these characteristics should be taken as a whole and not individually. In other words, you're not looking at a crowd of people and you're saying, okay, some of these people are gentle, some of these people are merciful, some of these people are going to be persecuted, some of these people are hungry for the Word of God or hungry for righteousness. No, these are, should be taken as, a, uh, in, uh, as parts of a whole that make up an entire character or a perfected character, okay? A godly character. So, when he says bless, the word bless means to be in a state of happiness. Now, the state of happiness can uh, come because of many things. It could be prosperity. could be relationships. But Jesus says that the person who is truly blessed is blessed inside, in other words, the blessings or the state of happiness starts from within because of their relationship with God. And so notice he says, blessed of those who are poor in spirit. And this idea of poor in spirit means that I recognize that I'm insufficient. I recognize a need to be filled by God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. Why would I mourn? Anytime you have a true revelation of God, it will break you down. If you say you've had a true kind of encounter with God and you were haughty against God, you were angry at God, you voiced your opinion at God, you didn't meet the true God. Blessed are the gentle. Now, sometimes people are abrasive, arrogant, haughty. Notice he said, blessed are those that are gentle. Verse 6, blessed are the hung, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I think right here, if you ever wonder why people are stuck in false teachings, false religions, because they're really not thirsting for true righteousness. If you have a hunger for true righteousness, you will always be filled and I will go a step further to say that that will always lead you to a place of freedom. In other words, even if you start off with, let's say, with a group, the Jehovah Witnesses, and if you're really hungering for righteousness, you won't stay there. You, you cannot stay there. And we could go on with other false religions, false teachings, false theologies. If you're hungering for righteousness, God, I really want to know you. That should be the hunger in our heart. And if that's not the hunger in a person's heart, then, uh, and we'll get to a verse where it says, now you're, you're tossing 
pearls before swine. You're giving that which is holy to dogs because they're not looking for the truth. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. By the way, some of these qualities, of course, are reflecting what God is, his character. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You cannot. Now, this, this pure in heart, by the way, comes as a result of the relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> now, this is interesting because notice that they will be called sons of God. This is what we're here for. We're not here, in a sense, to divide. Now, divisions come because people hate the gospel, but they certainly shouldn't come from the sons of God. Our primary purpose should be here, announcing the peace of God. And, and like I say, when you read through the scriptures, you're going to see these terms, by the way. Then he says, bless all the, those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now you're going now persecution is going to be, notice by the way, he says that the persecution has come for righteousness. In other words, as Christians, as believers, as sons of God, you are going to suffer persecution as a direct result of your faith. Okay? And there is a difference between the hardships of life that come from whatever reason. Okay, whatever reason. It can be our own foolishness. It can be the, 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 the evilness of someone else. And the ripple effect of that is suffering. But what he was referring to here is as a direct result of your faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to be persecuted. People will lie on you. So how does he tell us to handle that? You cannot control that. So the only thing that you can control is you by having these characteristics in your life. I want to read something quickly from 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. And remember, Peter was on the mount. He was at this very sermon. He heard this very sermon. And so some of this is going to sound reminiscent of that. You can see the influence of the Sermon Mount on uh, his theology, which is, would be, you know, uh, naturally. Now, verse 3 says, this is Second Peter chapter 1, and verse 3 says, For his divine power has given us everything, every requir everything required for life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and goodness. And by these, he, he has given us every, uh, given, uh, verse 4 again, by these, he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world through lust, through evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and increase and are increasing, they would keep you from being useless and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll stop there for a moment. I want to quickly read something in Galatians chapter 5. And uh, um, look at verse number 22. He says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, Self-control against such there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh and his passions and his desires. Now if we live by the Spirit, if we if we live by the Spirit, we must also follow the Spirit. Now I wanted to kind of bring these two in. One was Galatians chapter five and that's verse twenty-two by Paul to show you the continuity of how Scripture, how the theology is affected by the foundation of these qualities here. Now this is this is the quality right here. This is what should be in our spirits. And here's the thing. I can't control people. I can't control the circumstances of life, but I can control me. And so God always starts with me. Now, I'm going to pick this up in the next, uh, in the next video. And uh, we'll pick this up. Oh, um, I'll just pick it up. I'll see you in the next video. Okay.